you managed to navigate the curry without spilling it on your shirts, which was the, yeah. So, so lovely to see you all. I'm hearing some incredible stories about the heroic way people got here, driving through the Pennines, three different flights. So well done to all of you for, for getting here. So, so we got a fantastic session after lunch. So we'll, we'll kick straight on as we're running a little bit late. So huge pleasure to introduce John Burke, who I think knows more about cardiac manifestations of neuromuscular disease than anyone in the country, I would have thought, and ran a clinic for 25 years, was it? Yeah, and still going. So great pleasure to, to introduce John. Thanks very much indeed. It's, uh, it's my great pleasure to have this opportunity to tell you about cardiac dystrophinopathy, and I'm really grateful to the organizers for uh, inviting me. So um, a little bit of background, which I apologize to those of you who know all this already. Um, the dystrophin gene is the largest gene in the body. It's responsible for making the protein dystrophin. I'm sure you recognize that. Uh, that gene is situated on the short arm of the X chromosome. So it's an X-linked disease. Um, and dystrophin, the protein, is found in a whole range of different parts of the body, including skeletal muscle, the most obvious place, also in the heart, and also, perhaps you didn't know, in the brain also, which is why there's such an incidence of autism and ADHD in these patients. So the protein dystrophin has many, many functions, uh, but it's probably easiest to think about it as a, um, a protein uh, that links mechanical forces between cardiac cells from the cardiac point of view or skeletal muscle, if it's the skeletal muscles, links the inside of the cell, the contractile elements with the outside surrounding uh, structures. So males who are deficient in dystrophin develop Duchenne muscular dystrophy uh, and uh, those with Becker muscular dystrophy have a milder form because they make a partially functional dystrophin with a lot of variability. And not forgetting female carriers of the gene who are also at risk of cardiomyopathy. So many of you, I realize, will not uh, have first-hand experience or be expected to see a patient with Duchenne or Becker dystrophy, but I want to convince you that this is an ideal model for understanding what is going on in this and possibly other cardiomyopathies. Uh, and so it's a mechanism that we understand. We're talking about predominantly left ventricular dysfunction in this condition, in a dilated form of cardiomyopathy. So essentially, if you look at uh, Duchenne, Becker, and carriers, you'll see that the difference between them functionally is that the Duchenne uh, phenotype have no dystrophin whatever. Uh, the Beckers have, as I said, shorter variable functional forms, and the uh, female carriers uh, have uh, various aspects in a minority of patients who carry the gene only. So um, the incidence of cardiomyopathy then, all Duchenne patients develop cardiomyopathy, and about half of those, perhaps more, as they get older, uh, develop cardiomyopathy if they're Becker, and up to 17% of women carrying the gene on the abnormal gene on one of their X chromosomes will manifest muscle, cardiac, or cognitive impairment. And you can see on the right-hand column to yourselves that the impact it has on survival. So Duchenne patients tend to die in their late 20s, early 30s, with the average age of death in Becker being about 60. And we're not sure what the implication for carriers who are affected is. So leaving aside, it's probably old-fashioned to make this distinction between Duchenne and Becker because it's actually the phenotype rather than the genotype that determines what the condition's impact on the patient is. And that's what determines their care needs. So essentially, if you're not into genetics very much and you're wondering, let's simplify this, essentially you're talking in Duchenne and Becker and carriers who are affected in uh, as cells that are deficient in dystrophin are mechanically unstable. And of course, over time, just with the normal action of the heart, the heart begins to tear itself apart and the repair mechanisms are swamped uh, and can't replace what might otherwise <coughs> constitute normal repair. It, so in Duchenne, 
it's not a question of whether the heart will become affected or not. The heart is always affected, and it's just a question of when is the optimum time to introduce what treatments we think might work. This has nothing at all got to do with symptoms. None of these patients have symptoms until they're near terminal from a cardiac point of view, and so it has to rely on prospective screening surveillance. One of the really exciting things for me as a, a cardiologist is the way novel treatments that were talked about this morning uh, are relevant already in the Duchenne context. So if we look at uh, attempts to restore dystrophin in cells that are deficient in it or partly deficient in it, this is what I mean by disease-correcting therapies. And uh, this is a... The first one I want to talk about is atelurin. Atelurin is a derivative of gentamicin, which was found in MDX mice models to uh, ameliorate uh, some cases of dystrophin deficiency. So this is for treating nonsense mutations in the DMD genetic code. And about 20 to 27% of Duchenne patients have this kind of mutation. And in the cartoon on the right, you'll see in the top column, up, big barn, in the top column, you'll see what normally is supposed to happen. So as you read along the reading frame, you end up with a fully functional dystrophin protein at the end of it. In a nonsense mutation, that reading frame is blocked by a stop codon that shouldn't be there, and so the protein manufacturer stops and you get a defective protein made, which is less functional. Uh, what atelurin does in those cases is it allows reading through of the stop codon so that you end up with a functional protein at the end. And we know already that uh, atelurin, if deployed early, around the time that ambulation is beginning to deteriorate, that you will actually improve the natural history of the condition. So that's a treatment applicable to roughly 25% of patients with dystrophin deficiency. If you then look at exon skipping, this is an alternative way of treating patients. Again, uh, is already in operation. The easiest way to think about this is, you know the way your zip gets stuck, perhaps because of a defective zipper, uh, and you can't close the zip of your coat or whatever? Uh, that's essentially what exon skipping is doing. It's trying to get you to restore the closure ability of your zip without actually correcting the deficient area, the broken area. So essentially, you have a missing exon, uh, as de uh, depicted here, and uh, the exon skipping treatment is a daily taken medication which is supposed to allow you to jump over that deficiency and therefore complete the reading frame and produce dystrophin. That is already uh, being applied to treatment following uh, various tests of it. The important point, though, is that this treatment has to be tailor-made to your specific mutation. And you can imagine that there's a range of mutations. So exon skipping is applicable to deletion of exon 51, uh, which is a common deletion affecting about 13% of patients with Duchenne. Uh, and more recently, exons 45 and 53, which accounts for 8%. If you're a very rare mutation, the chance of you having uh, the ability for anyone to go and make your a specific registration number correction will probably never happen. <clears throat> so essentially you have skipping for these uh, commoner forms of um, deletions for Duchenne and it does lead to a partially functioning dystrophin protein uh, but so far the results, it's not been the breakthrough you'd expect in terms of transforming the natural uh, condition. Uh, and at the moment, ways are under, uh, uh, pharmacology is underway uh, to design better ways of delivering this treatment, which would be more efficient and more effective. And then, as many of you will know, there's gene therapies underway for Duchenne dystrophy, which is looking at, again, another way of trying to modify the Duchenne protein deficiency. 
So this is a case of taking um, stem cells, either from skin or from bone marrow, uh, isolating them, boosting their numbers perhaps, and then injecting them into a patient as a payload in a, an adeno-associated non-pathogenic virus. The um, various trials are underway and it's a kind of an open question at the moment whether this will be effective or not. We won't have the answers for some years yet. Finally, there's in terms again of the same theme of trying to replace dystrophin, you have the concept of uh, stem cell therapy. Now stem cells uh, are, uh, you, you take the stem cells, as I mentioned earlier, uh, and you, uh, the idea was that you would inject them into the myocardium, for example. But it's become clear more recently that stem cells in Duchenne are not normal themselves either. And so you do need to transform the stem cells to make them be able to function in the way you anticipate and you um, then can implant them. That's at an even earlier stage. So my reason for running through these different disease-modifying therapies with you is to show how far advanced it is based on the fuller understanding of what's going on in the cardiac dystrophinopathy and skeletal muscle dystrophinopathy uh, in this condition. I want to spend the rest of the time talking about um, conventional medications and essentially these are the this is a, a one slide summary of what we know at the moment uh, so the heart is abnormal from the start in Duchenne dystrophy from before birth the heart is abnormal uh, if untreated you develop a progressive cardiomyopathy symptoms only emerge when the heart function is at rock bottom, a bit like we were talking this morning, when patients normally would clinically present with other conditions. Therefore, you need regular heart checks to detect what's going on and to know when best to intervene and how intensively. Interestingly, steroid therapy, probably by reducing inflammation, is beneficial for the heart also in Duchenne, unlike in other cardiomyopathies. Heart medicines, that's conventional heart medicines, are well tolerated. We know that in, you've been used in combination in these patients. They do slow but don't prevent a progressive decline in heart function. And the key reason you might want to do this is that cardiac dysfunction determines an increasing proportion of um, the longevity of patients with Duchenne dystrophy. So I, I was lucky enough to be uh, chair of a working group, which you'll see there was convened and reviewed all the evidence for conventional cardiac treatments, and it's just been published and freely available um, to download. Uh, so read all about it if you're interested in working out why you'd want to intervene both in carriers or in children with Duchenne dystrophy to prevent the heart becoming a key determinant of survival in addition to all the other aspects. But essentially, if I summarize the flow diagram that's in that publication, which uh, essentially says that regular heart checks in a Duchenne-diagnosed boy should start from as soon as convenient after the genetic diagnosis is confirmed, and certainly before the age of six. Uh, steroids will commonly have already been started, and as you've heard me say already, the steroids actually uh, are also beneficial for the heart in Duchenne. So you start your schedule of surveillance, typically by echo and ECG, uh, and then you move down <coughs> through the green arm to start with the heart is normal, the heart is normal, the heart is normal, with checks repeated annually or at least every two years. When you get close to the age of 10, that's less than 10, you should start empiric ACE inhibitor therapy. Uh, that's because the detection of abnormality is increasingly common from then on, and you want to get in ahead of that. The, um, often in discussion with families, they will want to start that treatment much earlier, possibly from as young as six. And there's no reason not to do that, because there isn't an obvious downside to these treatments. As you reach uh, going down through the age and the boy is getting older, if there's any evidence of fibrosis on an MRI scan, if you do an MRI scan, or any degree of LV dysfunction, then you move to the red side of this uh, chart. 
And essentially, you start with an ACE inhibitor. You then add an antifibrosis agent. That's a mineralocorticoid antagonist. Uh, and then, typically, the heart will be excessively fast at rest. And therefore, you want to slow that down, because that's part of the destructive acceleration, if you like. So typically, a boy with Duchenne from before the age of 10 or earlier, if there's any evidence of cardiac dysfunction, will be on a triple treatment regime. The, um, one of the key elements here to recognize, and it's a common um, thing that parents worry about, is if the Duchenne boy is admitted with an acute illness, pneumonia, something of that kind, a fractured uh, femur or something from a fall, um, somebody will bound to say, oh, blood pressure is very low, we should stop your treatment. Uh, and they will do that. That's entirely appropriate at the time, but that doesn't mean the treatment shouldn't restart again as soon as recovery is underway. It's not an indication that treatment should be stopped permanently. Now, a key message in all of this from the conventional treatment point of view is that you can't compensate for what you didn't do in childhood by over-treatment in adulthood. So essentially, if you miss the boat, you've missed the boat. So essentially, you need to get treatments in early because for maximum effect, remember it's not replacing dystrophin, you need all the benefits and reducing the strain and the progressive deterioration of the heart. Sidestepping slightly to Becker dystrophy, we're in more difficulty here in terms of de uh, clinical decision making. And that's because the natural history is so variable and we have much less natural history data on which to base recommendations. Steroids are very uncommonly used, except in the severest, say, call them intermediate Duchenne Becker cases because of the downsides of steroids in terms of bone thinning and so on. The, but it's important to understand that Becker dystrophy cardiomyopathy is much more a key determinant of survival than it is in Duchenne because the muscle aspects, the skeletal muscle aspects, are often milder. So you need the same surveillance as you would use for Duchenne patients, except that typically the diagnosis will be made later in life and so uh, treatment and surveillance starts once the diagnosis is confirmed. Obviously, there's a much greater role for more advanced heart failure treatments in uh, Becker and for device therapies, defibrillators, LV assist devices, sometimes even cardiac transplantation, which is dictated by the phenotype, the overall phenotype, rather than just the cardiac aspect. It's not clear whether gene therapy, stem cell therapy, any of these things will actually be of benefit in Becker dystrophy for reasons that I won't go into. Finally, a word about carriers of the DMD gene, that's female carriers. The, the, the schedule of surveillance, uh, when a boy is diagnosed with Duchenne and mum is tested and two-thirds of mums will be found to be positive for carrying the gene on one of their X chromosomes, uh, those women should be recommended cardiac surveillance as well. Cardiac involvement may be their, typically is their only manifestation of the condition. Uh, and it's only a minority, about 80% of carrier women will not manifest any syndrome at all. <clears throat> so essentially, you would hope that they never come to light through this pathway, which is presenting as a full-blown cardiomyopathy with heart failure. You want to start surveillance here so that they become aware of why they're being <coughs> tested and uh, that they attend. And typically, again, it was historically ECHO and ECG that were the surveillance, especially with the greater sensitivity of ECHO. But the, uh, now, increasingly, its MRI imaging is recommended, even if only to allow the interval between testing to be lengthened out a bit. So if you're doing surveillance by ECHO, it should be every three years. If you're doing it by MRI, you can stretch it out to every five years because of its greater sensitivity. And essentially, if you have, as in most cases, normal uh, tests, you repeat the tests uh, in three to five years. If the test is abnormal, obviously you start treatment in the same way as you do for Duchenne and Becker. Uh, and if the test is equivocal, then you definitely need an MRI to check for fibrosis, which occurs earlier than the LV dysfunction. One of the key elements uh, which is often uh, highlighted by families is that 
cardiologists are often saying to families, uh, your, the, mom, the mom who carries the gene, your heart is normal, you don't need to have any more surveillance. That is not correct. You can develop cardio, cardiomyopathy de novo, having had previous heart checks that were normal, even the more sensitive ones. If you have an abnormality, then you start the same kind of triple treatment. Although you rarely need a beta blocker in carrier women, they don't tend to get the same fast heart rate. So essentially, I'll finish there simply by saying that if you want to um, read all about it, then you have two publications. One is the children's one that I mentioned to you, which also includes carriers, and the adult one, which has been published by Ros Quindlevin. Thank you very much. Absolutely fantastic talk. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think in the interest of time, we'll, we'll leave questions if that's okay, and perhaps people could ask you in the coffee break. I'll let Ruth get into position. Um, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Ruth this afternoon. Ruth and I uh, trained together in the west of Scotland in clinical genetics a number of years ago. She's now associate, um, honorary, honorary associate professor. Um, but she also organises a really good night out. So she's in charge of the dinner out tonight and um, anyone who's going along to that is sure to have a good time. Um, Ruth is going to speak to us this afternoon about hereditary amyloid and I'm sure we're in for a treat. Thank you. Thanks very much, Catherine, for the introduction. So I, I thought I'd start by showing a little picture of uh, Glasgow just to show how picturesque it is. And indeed, I took this on my cycle to work uh, just when crossing, just about to cross the river. These are my disclosures. So Expert consensus uh, statements have actually been produced at a European level, and I'm going to focus my talk today uh, to describe the recent UK consensus statement, which I was, was part of. So what is the reason for a consensus statement? Well, first of all, hereditary amyloidosis is a progressive multi-system condition, which is potentially life-limiting, uh, and it's frequently misdiagnosed or there's a delay in diagnosis. And there's now the advent of newer disease-modifying treatments. And it was felt that there's a need in the UK to have a diagnostic pathway um, to raise awareness of specialist services and how to access genetic testing, as well as uh, to improve family follow-up. So what is hereditary amyloidosis? So the transthyretin protein is made, produced in the liver and secreted uh, into the blood stream and CSF. Is this going to work? Yeah. There we go. And the, the variant protein uh, tetramer uh, dissociates to become the monomer um, and then misfolds and polymerizes to become amyloid fibrils, which are ultimately deposited. And the clinical manif manifestations of the condition largely depend on the site of amyloid a deposition in the various organs, but classically affect the heart and the nervous system. And there are more than 120 uh, variants described uh, globally, but in the UK we have common variants, and in particular in, in Scotland and Ireland we see the T80 um, variant, which is the commonest in our population. So Disease-modifying treatments have really had the opportunity to potentially change the landscape and outcome uh, and in terms of prognosis for individuals with hereditary ATTR. And I think this diagram nicely depicts the three main target areas. And on the right-hand side, also, uh, you can see with the little stars, this summarises what treatments have been shown to be effective in uh, different areas. And so first, the first target here is to reduce TTR production and some of the newer agents like patisseran and inotercin, the, which are the genetic silencers, and these act to interfere with messenger RNA uh, to reduce uh, production of TTR in the liver. 
The second target is, is here in terms of uh, by TTR stabilisation. And this is where uh, treatments like tefamidus come in. And this is the only uh, drug that has been so far shown to be uh, definitively effective in the treatment of cardiac amyloid and is licensed in the, in the US. And the third area is to increase elimination of deposits and there are ongoing trials in relation to this. So the emerging therapies has really increased the, the need for and the urgency to develop better imaging techniques, really to ensure the early detection of the condition and also the potential to track therapeutic response. And indeed, the newer imaging techniques have actually allowed us to, well, somewhat uh, reduced the need for invasive uh, myocardial biopsy. And since introduction, if you look uh, after pre-2012, uh, the introduction of newer diagnostic techniques, there's an improvement in median survival with ATTR uh, cardiomyopathy. So I want to move on now to talk about the, the, the UK consensus document. So the aim of this was to provide a practical guidance on the clinical screening, also genetic testing and follow-up of individuals either with suspected hereditary ATTR or um, at risk of because a family member has a TTR <coughs> variant. And there's three main aspects that are covered. So symptoms raising the possibility of hereditary ATTR, biopsy confirmed ATTR and asymptomatic individuals who ha are a relative of an, in of an individual with a TTR variant. And overall, in impact of the, the, the consensus paper is, is hopefully to improve access to genomic services, to increase awareness of these special, special services and the MDT uh, involvement, which I think is important in a multi-system condition, support coordinated follow-up and ensure access to early intervention and treatment. So really to look at the first uh, two, two cases there as part of the, the pathway, um, so um, I don't really have time for, in the interest of time, to really go through these pathways in, in, in great detail, but there are diagnostic pathways here for suspected either cardiac amyloidosis on the left-hand side or uh, neurological amyloidosis on the right. But I'd like to highlight a few points about these diagnostic pathways. So first of all, genetic testing is recommended early in the diagnostic pathway, and uh, furthermore, informed consent is, lies with the responsibility of the person doing the test, and I direct this to all the cardiologists out there. So, for those that are found to be TTR positive, they should be referred to regional genetic centre, because, of course, every individual with a TTR um, gene variant has multiple family members that may be at risk of developing the condition. They should have input of an amyloidosis specialist and, if possible, multidisciplinary input to guide further care. So the second main area covered by the consensus document was in relation to relatives at risk of hereditary ATTR. And I possibly don't need to go through this for the current audience, but thought I would say anyway, um, just to highlight the difference between two types of genetic testing. So in the last slide, we really talked about diagnostic genetic testing. So this is testing for individuals with symptoms or signs of the condition, which I think should definitely be uh, done in the, as a role of the cardiologists or neurologists and should be done early in the, path, in the diagnostic pathway. In comparison, the other type of testing is predictive genetic testing which is the testing of an asymptomatic individual. And in this family tree, which you can see over in the far right-hand corner, so the mother has the condition and the children are at 50% risk of having uh, inherited the TTR variant and therefore may be at risk of developing the condition in the future. And the, the, the consensus statement really highlights that this, this sort of predictive testing should be done within the setting of clinical genetics. Uh, it's not appropriate to offer this to children and that it should be done in conjunction with genetic counselling. And any gene positive individual should be, have, be uh, then offered the review of 
by an amyloidosis specialist, really to, to relieve anxiety, to do a full assessment at that time, and to um, outline the, the plan for future screening and investigations going forward. And it was, the, we, the paper recommends that uh, the future investigations, if the individual is um, clinically unaffected, should be then uh, continued uh, at point less than 10 years than what is expected for that variant. And there is a, there's a table within the document uh, really just to outline the, the age at which you would expect symptoms might occur at, depending on the different variants that's in the family. And either be guided by that or be guided by the age at presentation of the proband uh, within the family, so the affected family member. And also, asymptomatic individuals should be offered uh, enrolment into the Transcend study. And this is an important study, really, to try to increase our understanding about the natural, um, the, the prognosis of the condition, the way we don't know much about asymptomatic individuals and the natural lifespan of that. And I think more work has to be done in this area to understand the natural history of the condition. So I want to now move on to the second part of my talk, which I'm going to talk about some of the review that we did locally of our TTR families. So we reviewed all the TTR families that we had in our records, and the total number was 38. And the pie chart here just outlines either probands uh, versus relatives, and about half of them were, it was about half and half probands or relatives. If we look at... Uh, gender, so there were slightly more males and females. And if we look at the particular genotype, um, as I mentioned already, the most common one in our population is the T80A variant. And then if we look at a subgroup of patients, so there's a smaller group of patients, mainly because some of the patients that were gene positive sadly deceased or had moved out of the area. And if you look at the prevalence of cardiology in our cohort, about half of them uh, are affected with cardiology, with, with cardiomyopathy, rather. And uh, if we look at the different, it's here, so there's more males than females. And then if we look at the total with cardiomyopathy, uh, there's more probands than relatives, both for male and female. We also looked at the follow-up um, of individuals in this cohort and it's interesting because you can see there's a variety of different uh, follow-ups and some were seen in the ICC, some seen in the NAC, some seen by local cardiology and um, what was interesting is although all the gene positive individuals are offered uh, to attend the National Amyloidosis Centre, actually only two-thirds of them were attending which highlights the fact that a number of individuals uh, are not or don't feel it's practical for them to then travel to a national centre and that there's a, probably a need to uh, reassess how we, how we, how we offer uh, treatment. And we, we're hoping really in the west of Scotland to actually have a, a, a local uh, amyloidosis um, multidisciplinary <coughs> team that will act as a national level for families to avoid the need for them to travel. So if we look at the prevalence of uh, neuropathy in our cohort of patients, about a third of them, just over a third, are affected. And again, if we look at neurology follow-up, about half were uh, continuously uh, under neurology uh, follow-up, and uh, between those here and some had open access as well. And of those, if you look on disease-modifying treatment, about a third of them were on disease-modifying treatments. So looking at age of testing, so the age of testing, as you would expect, was slightly was higher in the probands than the relatives. And we wanted to carry out a review of our West of Scotland families, particularly in light of the New York Consensus uh, documents and the, now the introduction of these disease-modifying treatments. And we wanted to see how well cascaded we were. So uh, if we looked at the family trees, 
uh, how complete was the genetic testing. And we found that, in fact, in two-thirds of families, so of the 18, 12 of them, it was incomplete. And if we look um, specifically at uh, the patients that live in the local area, we, there are 22 of them uh, to whom we would be able to potentially contact um, to offer them predictive testing. So I'd just like to uh, summarise what I've really been saying. So there's a consensus uh, statement here which provides best practice recommendation for, for genetic testing and management of people with hereditary ATTR or at risk of the condition. And the aim is to increase identification of affected individuals and to help them access regular follow-up to treatment and um, potentially reduce uh, disease progression with the newer therapies. I think regional genetic centres do have the opportunity to review the TTR families and could consider proactively contacting individuals to offer cascade testing. But I think uncertainties still uh, exist about disease progression, the natural history of the condition, and I think uh, studies like Transcend are hopefully going to be quite uh, informative in time about this, but also the use of mod these modifying agents and the financial impact indeed on the NHS, which is strapped for cash. So I'd just like to thank the families and the co-authors on the paper, and as well as the team members here, so Joe Simpson, who's our local cardiologist with an interest in hereditary TTR, and also Kara and Fiona, who helped to put together some of the audit data. Thanks very much. Absolutely wonderful talk. Thank you very much indeed. I think we're running a little bit late, so again, I think we'll just leave the questions to the coffee break if that's okay. Um, so I think psychology for, for the ICC patients, I think it's something we, we do poorly as a group, and I think nationally it's, it's something we're all trying to work on. So delighted to, to see the, the next talk about Jamie Forrest and how we inbuild, I guess, psychological techniques for, for all of us in genetic counselling. So really looking forward to it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, so yes, thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. It's a real honour to be here. Um, so the reason I'm so interested in how we can use more psychology-based techniques in genetic counselling and indeed across <coughs> clinical ICC settings is because I used to work in psycho psychology services um, and now I'm training as a genetic counsellor. I don't have any disclosures to make. Um, today I'll be talking about a definition of genetic counselling um, and why knowledge of psychology-based techniques are useful in ICC set settings. I'll be talking about commonalities in psychotherapeutic professional approaches. I'll also go into a brief background to some types of psychological theories, including cognitive um, behavioural therapy, or CBT, acceptance and commitment therapy, or ACT, and dialectical behaviour therapy, or DBT. And as I know, um, grief, unfortunately, is something that a lot of patients in the ICC setting um, will experience. I'll also talk about models of loss. Um, so to, to define genetic counselling first, so genetic counselling is the process of helping people to understand and adapt to the genetic, medical, psychological, and familial implications of the genetic contributions to disease. And I'll specifically be talking about the adapt element of that definition. So in ICC settings, there are a number of psychosocial challenges that you, your families might be facing. So as I'm sure you're familiar with, the risk of sudden death, uh, complex grief, inheritance risk to other family members, um, adjustment to diagnosis, um, exercise restrictions and ICD shocks, and parental anxiety and adjustment after cardiac arrest in a child. So there are commonalities in professional approaches in psychotherapeutic professions. Um, as counsellors get more um, experienced in their roles, these are the types of things that people um, apply more and more in their sessions. So for example, mirroring language. So using the words that patients use. Um, it helps patients to understand more about um, the session and it also helps them feel included um, because you're using their language essentially. Um, 
giving praise. So I think lots of clinicians feel that praise can be patronising, but actually um, patients really appreciate praise, especially from someone um, that they view as a professional person. Um, reframing, so I saw a really good example of this in the Marfan clinic that I observed um, in my last rotation. Um, so the Marfan consultant um, was seeing a Marfan patient and they came in and they were incredibly low in mood because they just had this diagnosis of cancer. Um, it had been detected incidentally on a, on a scan that they were having as part of their Marfan syndrome. Um, and, you know, the patient was saying, I can't believe I'm having to deal with this. You know, I've had Marfan syndrome all my life and now I'm having to cope with this as well. And the consultant just turned that around and said, well, actually, it's really lucky in a sense that this was detected early for you um, because it was incidental. It's at an earlier stage of the disease. Um, Role playing and visualizations. Um, so, for example, in a genetic counseling session, um, a genetic counselor might role play with a patient about how they could speak to um, their children about a genetic condition in a family. Um, and I think it can be helpful to realize that um, the brain is quite mechanical in that way, and practicing scenarios um, can help patients to um, more easily integrate that into their lives. And fostering a kind of genuine curiosity in the patient and their experiences and their perspectives can also really foster a, a, a feeling of authenticity and, and um, be beneficial for the patient. So cognitive behavioural therapy. So this is one of the main models used in psychology services in the NHS at the moment. Um, it's got a strong evidence base and it's also uh, interventions can be shorter so it's really quite popular. Um, and it's based on this model of thoughts, emotions and behaviours kind of feeding into each other in these cyclical patterns and that these patterns can be self-reinforcing. So the more that we think or feel or behave in a certain way, the more that becomes habitual. And the first step in trying to help a patient to recognise that and overcome it is by first helping them to recognise what thoughts and what emotions and what behaviours they're actually having. So for example, in an ICC setting, um, someone might be really worried about their ICD going off, they might be really worried that it's going to really hurt, which might feed into emotions such as feeling really a lot of fear, a lot of panic, feeling disempowered, feeling out of control of the situation, which might feed into behaviours such as avoiding, you know, extreme avoidance of things that they might otherwise enjoy, self-isolating, which can then give them more space and time to have the kind of difficult thoughts about how worried they are about it going off. So you can literally draw out these kind of um, models with patients to help them realise what kind of cycles they're in. Um, and then ACT is what's known as a type of third wave CBT. Um, so it's just a different way of thinking about CBT. Um, and this is more coming from a perspective of actually negative human emotions are part of a web of experience that make up an entire life. So um, it's not necessary, necessary that we have to change every single difficult thought or every single difficult emotion and actually being able to accept that life does involve some challenges but also lots of joy is part of helping a patient maybe accept that some difficulty is, is normal but also to start practicing behaviours that are more in line with their, with their values and their goals. Um, it can also be helpful to help patients develop emotional openness and psychological flexibility um, and also sometimes trying to change the primary thought itself is too difficult because thoughts um, naturally come into our minds all the time. Um, so rather changing the secondary thoughts or our response to our thoughts. So for example, if someone is really worried about their ICD going off, having a thought of kind of feeling empowered and thinking, yes, but it's still very important to me to do X, Y, Z. Um, in my life and so I'm still going to do that, I still can do hard things. Um, it's very different from having that initial thought and then thinking I can't do these things, I want to stay inside and, and avoid all of those activities. Um, and the key thing about most of these um, theories is that they're quite present focused, so mindfulness is about a focus on the here and now. Most of the things that um, humans worry about in general are things that have either happened in the past or will or might happen in the future and um, so trying to bring patients or orientate them back to what they can do um, in the moment. Dialectical behaviour therapy or DBT was developed by a psychologist called Marsha Linehan specifically for patients with emotionally unstable personality disorder. Um, she recognised that um, 
people with the UPD just could not tolerate um, CBT because it inherently involves kind of challenging your own thoughts and, and behaviours, um, which some people just aren't receptive to and it's not helpful. So it can be useful to have a bit of a toolkit of different theories, um, depending on what people are receptive to. So the key components of DBT um, are distress tolerance, emotion regulation, interpersonal skills and mindfulness. And it's based on this idea of the central dialectic. So um, it's very different to, in a debate, two, two people might have very different opinions. They might be um, giving evidence of why their opinion is possibly the better one or, or the right one. In a dialectic, you, it, there's an understanding that two seemingly opposite things can both be completely true at the same time. So for example, um, in a DBT session, there's this central idea that the emotions and the thoughts that are driving someone's behaviour, even if it's not helpful to them, are understandable given their experiences, but that behaviour isn't helpful to them or to their life. Um, so, for example, um, in an ICC setting, um, if someone has experienced grief um, and you know they're having lots and lots of difficult thoughts and emotions because of that, that's understandable and you can validate that but if they've then developed an unhelpful behavior such as drinking a lot to try and cope with those difficult feelings that's not helpful to them in their life and having that focus on it not being helpful for them rather than it coming from a judgmental place in you as a therapist is also really important so moving on to talking about loss so loss is a much broader term um, so it can be loss of a loved one it could be loss of um, a sense of identity as someone is adjusting to illness. It could be um, loss of a, a much-loved exercise routine, for example. Um, bereavement is more specifically about the loss of a loved one. Um, and grief is the process that someone goes to as they try to a adjust to either loss or bereavement. So the grieving process, um, previously stages of grief model, um, it helped shape our understanding of what people might experience, but it's not helpful to view those stages as, as rigid or sequential. Um, so previously, what was described were things like denial and anger and depression and bargaining and then coming to a place of acceptance, um, was actually, it looks very different for everyone. So some people might go through two of those, some people might go through all of them and then think they've come to a place of acceptance and then the next week feel incredibly angry again. Um, so understanding that actually it's, it's a universal but individual experience is, is really helpful. And there's different types of grief as well. So anticipatory grief is the type of grief that someone knows someone they love is going to pass away, and, and, but it hasn't actually happened yet. So for example, um, someone with a relative who has heart failure. Um, or secondary loss is the kind of loss that comes from an initial loss. So for example, if a person passes away, say a parent for example, then the person might then lose their childhood home as well as the first person and, and the childhood home is the secondary loss. There's no right or wrong way to feel at any time during the grieving process, so experiences that might come and go are things like sleep problems, appetite changes, physical health problems. Some people might withdraw from others and some people might want to be with others constantly. Um, people might feel isolated or sad or depressed or shock or in denial and um, they might feel numb and numb is quite a complicated one because people then might feel guilty that they're not feeling the things they think they should be feeling in a grief reaction and normalizing that normalizing that actually um, numbness is a natural response as well it can be a kind of psychological defensive mechanism to not allow yourself to feel the full weight of the grief um, Relief as well, so say someone is a, has been a caregiver for someone for a very long, very long time, they might feel relief that they actually will have you know, more of their own independence and, and life back and they might feel guilty about that. Or even if the relationship had an element of abusiveness about it, then someone might feel relief that someone has passed away. And again, that's, that's a, a natural response. Um, and so mixed feelings can make it even more complex, the grief, the grief process. So to summarise, um, I think an understanding of psychology-based techniques can be useful in genetic counselling settings, but also in the entire clinical ICC setting. Um, and hopefully some psychology-based theories might be helpful in your work supporting patients. Um, and it can be really helpful to normalise the range of grief reactions that patients who have experienced loss or bereavement might go through. Thank you, Jimmy. That was really helpful. I think it's always 
we can't say this stuff enough for our patients. I think it helps them, it helps us in our care of them and their families. So I think that's a really important message you've given us. Um, well, I am switched on. Um, next person up, I'm pleased to present um, Mohammed Wafiq. Um, is a clinical geneticist based in London. So, and um, I'm really pleased to hear this being discussed here as a, a clinical geneticist who finds herself endlessly in numerous MDT meetings. I think if we have a good example to demonstrate how to do it well and the benefits of it, that brilliant. So thank you, Mohammed. Oh, thank you for offering, <coughs> offering me the opportunity to present this case. So um, I hope you find this case interesting. Um, it is a case in which I, we identified an unexpected genetic finding with the help of the ICC MDT. So I will cut into the chase. Uh, this is a 14-year-old girl who presented with out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Um, she was referred from pediatric cardiology and was admitted at the Evelina Children's Hospital <clears throat> at the time. The family history was reported to be unremarkable. Uh, and in her past medical history, she was reported to have had two syncopes, uh, and they were both exercise related, but self recovered. She also had dyslexia and had an EHCP, but no overt learning difficulties or, or intellectual disability. She was on no regular medication, and there were no adverse exposures uh, reported or other significant events. <clears throat> So the story started with her dancing in her room. The parents um, noted a, a bang in the room upstairs. They went up and she was uh, completely unconscious. Um, they called 999. She was actively resuscitated, was transferred to her local hospital, uh, subsequently transferred to the Evelina where she was intubated, ventilated, uh, quite abnormal ECGs and multiple arrhythmias on admission. <clears throat> and she was started on a beta blocker infusion as well as electrolyte corrections. Uh, she was subsequently extubated, was hemodynamically stable, and then she was stepped down at day six from PICU on a ward, a pediatric uh, cardiology ward. She had the subcutaneous ICD inserted and um, her beta blockers were switched to oral nadolol. She had good compliance. Uh, she was discharged. She had a good recovery, although she had some hypoxic ischemic insult uh, neurological manifestations, but she had uh, done a well or a good uh, neuro rehab recovery, and she's under regular surveillance. So we were involved very early on when she was admitted in PICU at Evelina. Um, and these were her ECGs. So I, actually, this is a, a post-discharge ECG on an exercise stress test. But her admission EC, ECGs were quite abnormal, showing narrow and broad complex tachycardia, bi, uh, bidirectional VT, ventricular bigeminy. Uh, but her echo in, uh, in, when she was in sinus rhythm, rhythm was um, normal. It showed a structurally normal heart. So we are seeing uh, multiple <clears throat> arrhythmia and polymorphic um, ventricular arrhythmias and tachycardia uh, on the background of a structurally normal heart. So the working diagnosis was that, was that of CPVT. As I said, we saw the family on PICU. Um, we spoke to the parents, their non consanguineous parents from Romania. The extended family lives in Romania. They were the only family members living in the UK. Uh, the, far, the father reported some occasional heart jumps, um, the way he described it, and mom had some palpitations during exercise and an episode of um, vasovagal, which what appeared like a vasovagal syncope in the past. The eight-year-old sibling was completely fit and healthy. So at this point, we thought, well, the family needs to be seen in the ICC clinic for deep phenotyping. So this is what we have done. And the first family member who was assessed was, was the younger sister, who was completely asymptomatic, had normal ECG, echo, and exercise tolerance test. The father had normal ECG and echo. His blood pressure at the beginning was uh, found to be high, but 24-hour blood pressure monitoring was normal. He had an exercise tolerance test, and in stage five, it showed some few ventricular ectopic beats, but nothing too major. And he ended up having a coronary artery and, a CT coronary uh, arteries, and it showed mild coronary disease, but nothing significant. The mother, on the other hand, she had a normal ECG and echo, but her exercise stress test was suspicious of CPVT. So in stage three ETT, she had ventricular bigeminy. And at this stage, we thought, well, we're seeing a phenotype that's maternally inherited. 
So at the point, uh, I probably should have mentioned that earlier, but at the point she was admitted at the Evelina, uh, the R129, which is um, the ICC panel at the Royal Brompton was sent uh, by the pediatric cardiology team. So this is a 174 gene panel, but with a particular focus on um, a, a sub-panel of six genes associated with CPVT. So we had the CALMS, CALM123, CASQ2, RY, R2, and TRDM. And the panel has shown a missense variant in RYR2. And um, we know that RYR2 is an important uh, gene associated with um, calcium uh, induced calcium release in the cardiac myocyte. So it's part of the sarcoplasmic reticulum calcium complex and it controls the flow of calcium ions out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the cytoplasm. Uh, we know it's highly expressed in the heart. We know that it's um, linked to 60% of CPVT clinically proven cases. So normally, under normal circumstances and um, situations of beta, beta adrenergic stimulation, so when there is um, exercise or emotion, uh, what happens is the calcium is um, um, goes inside the cell via LT-type calcium channel, and then there is sarcoplasmic reticulum loading and then the RYR2 facilitates spontaneous calcium um, outflow again into the cytoplasm. This increases the cardiac contractility to cope with the um, uh, beta adrenergic stimulation or the fight, flight, fright mechanism. Uh, but in um, CPVT due to RYR2 variants, uh, this mechanism is exaggerated. So the calcium in induced calcium release is exaggerated and this suggested that this is primarily due to gain-of-function mutations. And this is what uh, previous uh, literature evidence has shown, doing some functional studies on missense variants in RYR2, showing that gain-of-function is associated with CPVT, whereas loss of function is associated with uh, a newly described arrhythmia phenotype of um, calcium release deficiency syndrome. Uh, and we know that there are mutational hotspots in RYR2, and interestingly enough, this variant was in one of the mutational hotspots. So on a molecular level, we had a variant that was uh, in a CPVT-related mutation hotspot, particularly the central domain. And also, uh, it's absent from NOMAD, which is a, a large data set of pre presumably healthy individuals with no cardiac disease. Uh, we also had um, in silico tools supporting pathogenicity in eight of um, the nine algorithm used, and we had a, a high rebel score, which is essentially an algorithm that combines um, uh, a bigger number of, of in silico tools together. So according to the ACMG, ACGS uh, variant classification and interpretation guidelines, uh, we had uh, two, we had uh, a variant that is actually <coughs> in the hot variant of uncertain significance category. So we have variants can be classified into benign pathogenic or the gray area in between the uncertain significance. But this variant, because we already knew that it has to supporting and one moderate evidence, um, then it's it's in that hot VUS category. Uh, sorry, two moderate and one supporting. So um, we were thinking this is a very suspicious variant on the molecular level, and we haven't used any of the phenotypic criteria, but there was a uh, an intermediate or even high suspicion of CPVT prior to doing the uh, test. So we are likely to use something like PP4, which is the um, phenotype uh, or family history criteria being specific to a certain disease. Uh, but we thought because the mother has a phenotype as well, we, we should test the parents and, and just conclude the case. And this is what we did. And we did testing in the parents, but actually neither of them carry the mutation. So this was an unexpected finding and uh, surprising to us because given that the mother has a phenotype and the daughter has the same phenotype, although the mother has a mild phenotype, uh, then she should carry the same mutation. And this is why we uh, discussed this case on several occasions in the ICC MDT. This was probably the second time we discussed it. And we thought, what might be the explanation of this? Is the mother low level mosaic for the RYR2 variant? Is there another um, mutation in the RYR2 in the mother or even another channelopathy gene variant? We haven't, remember, we haven't screened the whole panel, it was just a targeted analysis by Sanger sequencing for the mutation identified in the child. Is, is the mother just a phenocopy? Quite unlikely scenarios, but we thought we would do an, the NGS panel on actually her 
uh, blood sample which was stored at the Royal Brompton lab and also uh, we uh, managed to get a maternal buccal swab. So this would be indicative of epithelial cells. Um, and she did indeed have mosaicism in the RYR2, so she had 9% of the blood sample cells affected with the mutation and 4% of the buccal cells affected as well. So this obviously is a result that has implications because the recurrence risk in this, in this situation might be up to 50% to the daughter. So we're still testing the daughter. We haven't got the results back yet. She had to be repaired in her own right. So as I said, this was an interesting um, finding and we thought we would, we would check the literature whether there's any reports of RY, RYR2 somatic or gonadal mosaicism. And I found this paper from 2010 by a French group where um, they actually present a proband who uh, had recurrent syncope and a positive exercise stress test uh, <clears throat> and was found to have this constitutional ROIR2 uh, missense variant. Now the brother of the proband was reported to have suddenly died at the age of 10 while running du during a soccer game uh, and the mother was found to be mosaic for the same variant but she had a negative stress test and um, her levels are, of mosaicism were somewhere uh, between 10 to 25 percent across the cells examined. These were buccal uh, cells, epithelial cells, urinary cells, and leukocytes DNA from the blood. So we had a case of mosaicism, but no phenotype associated. Um, this was the second report in the literature, again by an American group in 2009, uh, and it showed two siblings with sudden cardiac death. One of them had full-blown CPVT, and the mother was uh, asymptomatic and had a normal exercise stress test, but again, she's mosaic for a variant that is causative in the siblings. So we thought that this is a, a probably something that is non-report unreported in the literature before, and we contacted the Royal Brompton Lab to check whether they've had any cases or they've observed RYR2 mosaicism associated with a phenotype, and they said that they actually um, do have, and they're looking into their cohort for cases of mosaicism in uh, ICC genes generally. So they've got three families in their cohort uh, with RYR2 mosaicism. And you can see that, like for example, in family uh, two, there is an unaffected, a phenotypically unaffected parent who's mosaic for a variant that's causative in two affected siblings who presented with recurrent syncope and had ETT features of CPVT. And in family three, for example, um, this was um, a child who presented with um, a sudden cardiac death had the RYR2 variant, uh, pathogenic variant in a constitutional state. The father also had uh, the same variant in a mosaic state, but he was reported to have uh, abnormal <coughs> exercise stress test with um, bidirectional couplets. So he had some features of CPVT on his electrophysiology. Um, and again, family number one, so there was sudden cardiac death, there was a child who had the current syncope, CPVT features. The mother was found to have um, mosaicism of the causative variant, but her phenotype is a little bit unclear, so she has paroxysmal AF, uh, as well as might be dilated left ventricle. So this is in terms of their um, observation in, in mosaicism in RYR2, and they actually said that they've got three other families with um, mosaicism and other ICC genes as associated with cardiomyopathy, and just in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through each family of these ones, but uh, these findings indicate, these are interesting findings for us, and um, we thought that this is something worth putting up together, so this is what we're doing at the moment. The learning points for me as a trainee in clinical genetics in this case was actually the value of detecting mosaicism generally in, in, in genetic conditions and in ICC specifically, and, 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 and having a potentially life-saving therapies and procedures which can be used for these patients. Obviously, we can offer better risk assessment and cascade screening if we know exactly what is happening. Um, to me, this is something that could have been missed, could have been missed uh, um, from a phenotypic perspective, whether this family was not accurately phenotyped, could have been missed on a molecular level, whether it, we've stopped that Sanger sequencing, we haven't gone more and done more investigations or obtained different types of tissues or cells. So uh, it was a learning point for me. And also the, the, the technique we're using for variant detection um, and the sensitivity of the technique. So we know that Sanger sequencing can detect mosaicism to up to 10, 20%, but anything lower than that might be missed. So this is when high coverage targeted NGS has a higher advantage over uh, Sanger sequencing. And you know, we talk about whole genome sequencing, whole exome sequencing, and they have a higher kind of um, 
kind of horizontal coverage across the genome, but the depth of the reads might be less than a high, high coverage targeted NGS panel. And this is where the beauty of this comes in. And also the partial or atypical phenotypes that can be associated with mosaicism. So we saw how the mother was uh, had a, a, a mild kind of phenotype where the daughter presented early on with out-of-hospital VF. Um, and, and, a, and a big lesson for me, if there is a phenotype, always look for the genotype because it's likely that you will find it. And the value of the MDT, the ICC MDT and all of this, and, and the family was really, really grateful for uh, the work that we have done for them. Uh, I would like to thank everyone in the ICC MDT and a particular thanks to the um, uh, genetics and genomics scientists at the RBH. They've been really, really helpful in, in this case and this family. Thank you so much. Fantastic case, thank you so much, and just helps with the paranoia of every cardiologist when we come to genetic testing, doesn't it? Great, well, um, I think in the interest of time, we'll, we'll, we'll call it a day. Thank you very much to all the speakers. Fantastic session, absolutely brilliant. Um,